What's up, Hyperfast Nation? On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with high school friend and nearly two decade veteran of the real estate industry. Welcome to the great Jimmy Branham. What's up, Jimmy? Hey, Dan. How are you? Thanks for having good, me. Good, good. I thought we might pour a little pappy, right? Man. Is that enough? Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Uh, yeah, so I'm super stoked to have you on the show. Why don't you start off by telling people out there a little bit about yourself <clears throat> and your, your real estate career. And cheers, by the way. Sure. Hey, <laughs> cheers. Um, well, like you said, I got in the industry about 17 years ago. Hmm. Good stuff, man. Got to do this more often. Yeah. <laughs> uh, got in the industry about 17 years ago and have been fortunate enough to kind of bounce around a lot of areas within the industry. So kind of started out on my own and really floundered at first. Hmm. Didn't really know where to get started, but just kind of felt my way through the like first. solo agent? Solo or... agent. Just a solo agent. Just kind of, you know. Like small was, broker, <clears throat> big broker? No, I, I went own? to Kai's. I've been at the okay. same brokerage my entire career and um, was kind of feeling my way around there and then. Uh, got invited to sell in a development community. And so I went into new construction and sold. It was a big condo conversion. Did that for a couple of years. Got to see the developer side. This is like of, early, mid 2000s? This is, this is right so before the crash. Pre crash? Yeah, okay. this is like 2005, 2006. So got to see that whole thing go down and um, sold there and then jumped on to probably the largest producing team in the area, uh, Marta Dupree. They were selling about, at that time, like 2008, about $100 million a year. And so we got real. So like in today's <laughs> dollars is like half a billion, right? Pretty like close. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a big <laughs> it was a big operation, and at that point we had started selling for banks. So we got real heavy in the REO game right there. REO short sales. We were doing a lot of that stuff down here, at, right after the crash. Um, worked with her for a while, and then went out and kind of started my own team and jumped out on my own back in 2013, 2014. And now we've got a you know a very small team, a couple of assistants, a couple of guys that run with me, and uh, we go sell you know luxury properties in the local market. Yeah, I like I like uh, you know highlighting about the, the team experience. I think a lot of people starting out um, can benefit by being on the team. What what is it about the team? Do you think that is most beneficial? Is the training, mentorship, guidance? The leads. Yeah, I mean, I think all it's all. It. I think it's all of it, really. Um, and and I highly encourage anybody that's new getting into the industry that you get on a team, and that you don't just jump on the first team that you see. Find somebody that you respect in the industry, somebody that you know that you would trust, and that you would want to learn from, and get on there and learn. Focus on learning first rather than leads, because the leads. You've got to learn to self-generate your leads. Right. And if you get leads, that's great. You can learn to execute a little bit, but the execution is not that complicated at the end of the day if you're good at giving customer service. It's really read, give good customer service. That's fine. Any, anybody can really do that. It's really trying to find the business and communicate your value add to clients out in the marketplace. What, you know, looking back, you, know, you, you floundered on your own got good with the team, then went off to your own team. Like, you know, now you've probably experienced churn a little bit mm -hmm. or, or uh, people leaving. Sure. Like, looking back on that experience, do you think there was a way your, your old team could have, like, built some system, you know, more room for you to, to grow so that you're there longer? Or do you think it's just like a natural progression? Um, I don't always think it's a natural progression. Right. I think actually... Um, things definitely could have been done to, to keep that team together a lot longer. And I think that's happening now and people are realizing that you've got to be able to add a lot of value, show a lot of value to your current team members and not really rummage in their pockets too much, right? I mean, if they go get deals, let them keep the majority of that share and give them good support and really help them out in those deals and enable them to go you know, build their business. And I think if you do that naturally, people won't want to leave you, right? Like at the end of the day, if, if I'm here to set them up for success, they're not gonna wanna leave. Now, some people will always say, hey, I can go build this, I might wanna do this on my own, and that's totally fine, and we're happy to even launch people that way. If they wanna go do their own thing, we don't have any hard feelings for them at all. What do you think is 
like how, how would someone on a team know when they're ready, you think? Like how did you know when you were ready to um, go <laughs> when I <laughs> when I looked at my current deals that I was doing mm -hmm. and thought I'm making X and if I wasn't on this team I would be making Y. And mm -hmm. I generated a majority of these deals. It's a no-brainer. Okay, so you were kind of separating in mental bucket, or maybe you wrote down even like, this is my pipeline or what I've sold yeah. the last year. This is how many I generated. This is what the team generated, and then kind of did the math on that. Correct. Okay. Correct. I was just looking at my pipeline and realizing if I'm the one generating the business that I'm actually executing then I can just go out and do this on my own. Why am I relying on the team? Now, if they were changing splits, if I was, if they were changing pay structures, I would have stayed because there's benefits to being on that team. Right. Not just, you know, I have no problem paying the team some of their due. It's just when that due is a little bit too fat. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, you bring that up. Like when we started off, we treated every closing the same on our team, mm -hmm. right? Whether we generated the team, inside sales agent, open house, whatever, they were all the same. Then, um, that was the old model. I mean, that, that seemed like that was very yeah. much the old so model. So this yeah. is for us, I don't know, 14, 15, we're doing it that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, then we rolled out a system. We said, okay, um, people, you know, people are leaving and they're going down the street to, you know, big box realty, whoever. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, they're getting a, a 30K cap, right? That was kind of like the average in our market back then. I think it's come down a little. You know, the, the broker margins are getting mm -hmm. a little worse. Um, they are. But yeah, we kind of did a system where we we decided, okay, we'll, we'll still treat all the leads the same, but when they've generated this much, uh, you know, team, company dollar uh, from their own leads, sure. Uh, 30k or, or you know thereabouts um, when they hit that number then we'll put them to 100 percent on right. their own because now you know i've created a situation where on their own business it's no different than me and you know being out on your own but in addition to that they get all these other team yeah. leads and benefits yep yep yeah i'm seeing that structure within large brokerages as well and then if you're able to pass that along to the team we kind of do the same thing of a sliding scale it's not a hard and fast. It's basically on performance and longevity with the team, and then that grows. And then, of course, if the lead is coming from the team, then that's a different split. But if you're out getting your business, we want that to stay pretty high. So you've been, you've been, I guess, coming up on ten years now since you formed your own. Yeah, group, yeah, we're team. we're getting close to it. Uh, yeah, next year will be ten for you. What what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned over that decade now? Um, I think some of the biggest lessons are really learning how to delegate uh, the smaller tasks, which a few years ago we got virtual assistants that are overseas and they've been very helpful in allowing me to use my time wisely, serving clients and getting business rather than de dealing with paperwork and administrative tasks. So I think that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned. The second one is also um, just really looking out for other people more than yourself in general in the business, whether it's your clients or whether it's the members on your team. If you do that without mm. without the money getting in the way, like don't, if you care for people first, the money will end up following it. Don't even right. worry about making money on that deal or that per, like it'll end up happening because if you're doing people right, then they're gonna come to you. What's your, what's your structure now uh, on the support side and then on the agent side? You've got uh, some VAs, in-office people, sure. support, or yeah, um, we have actually no no paid support in office. Okay. Um, it's all VA. We have two VAs um, that we use, and they do uh, all of our marketing materials for us. They'll you know create brochures. They'll create do all of our back end CRM uh, stuff. They'll send out our emails, our blasts, newsletters. Um, you know. They'll pull big data and say, we're gonna target this neighborhood and shoot out emails or shoot out you know, messages. And, um, and then they'll also really you know, do our transaction coordination. So once we get deals under contract, they're really dealing with title, mortgage, everybody else and keeping things in check. And we've had to set up all those checklists for them, right. but they're very, very good at following the checklist. Yeah, you have to yeah. train them or plug them into yep. some system, right? You can't just sure. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then what? What about on the agent side? How many? How many agents? Agent are side. With you? I really have two two other full time okay. agents that are that are working. We have a couple. Uh, we have several part time agents as well. But you know they're there. We're, we're there to support them if they ever have a deal come across their desk or if a personal deal. Then we're we're there to help them for that. What what part of the business do you personally enjoy most right now? Uh, I enjoy listing and marketing the the higher end properties. Um, I also enjoy investment analysis on certain properties for out of town clients, which we've seen a lot the last two years. So those are the areas I really enjoy. Um, I really just like working with people I like too. So it doesn't matter whether it's buyers, sellers, you know, we just, we have fun. What's the biggest challenge right now in the business? Biggest challenge is finding uh, good quality inventory. That's the biggest challenge. And that's even been, with higher interest rates or still a challenge. Yeah. If you, so if you look, I mean, at least our local data here, um, 2018, 2019, we were probably double the inventory that we're at right now. Oh wow. And the inventory okay. has even gone up. So we probably had a month of inventory when it got to its lowest point. We're at about, yeah. eh, on average, three months. We were at six to seven months back in 18, 19, before 2020, you know, before the pandemic. So um, <clears throat> so we're still nowhere near we need to be. It's interesting, particular with South Florida, thinking about 2008 and nine, I think, that, that time period. Yeah. Like, I remember the movie The Big Short, like, Florida was the area where they yeah. portrayed in that yeah. movie, right or wrong, yeah. where they, they came down to investigate if there was a bubble. And um, it almost seems like Florida led the way back then, right? Yeah. In, in the bubble, the, the great big crash. Florida's and always doing something. Now it seems like the opposite. Like it's, you know, the market inventory is creeping up in a lot of places and big, big price drops in some markets, not all, mm -hmm. um, but nothing like 08. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll get to that level. I think it's completely different. Sure. But um, <clears throat> what's different about Florida right now that they, it seems to be like the fundamentals seem to be stronger. Yeah, it, it does. Um, you know, it, it seems that Florida um, <clears throat> has always been a desired destination for people in the Northeast. Uh, I do think there was an element of it wasn't maybe totally socially acceptable or it was the place to retire. Um, I think once COVID happened and things were open in Florida and people could come down and, and you know, live their lives to a certain extent, it kind of opened the floodgates a little bit. And then when people were down here, they kind of realized, well, you know, there's a lot of remote work. We can work, live and play down here. We could even go back. It's easy enough to go back if you got to go to the office for a week, two, three or four. I mean, you know, you do some remote work. I mean, you work from all over, right? right. So that's really what, what set it off. And, and, and really, I think once the advent of air conditioning happened in, in South Florida, no, really, it's like <clears throat> South Florida is the best place to be. Uh, yeah. It really is. Because like if it's hot outside, who cares? You go inside, you're in the air conditioning, yeah, it's right? It's pretty comfortable so in here. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. It doesn't matter if it's muggy out. And then the, then it's going to change. I'd rather deal with muggy than snow, right? And so... And, and really, Especially if there's, if there's no mountain around, yeah, yeah I don't, don't want to yeah. be in it. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then we've... I mean, if you're looking at Southeast Florida, there's a limited slice Right. land that you can build on. It's Everglades, ocean, and that's all you got. Yeah, you stole that from Grant Cardone, didn't you? No, <laughs> no. That, 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 that's been around here. for a year. Maybe actually, he stole it from you. Actually, no, I, I, you probably stole it from Mike Pappas, our CEO. He said that from, you know, from when I started. Yeah, I know, Cardone puts that out a lot. He says you got Everglades, 10 miles, ocean, and I don't know how many people, 20 million yeah. people in between, right? And yeah, I actually don't watch Grant Cardone too much. I should probably watch more, maybe, I don't know. Well, he's, he's buying a lot of deals around here for sure. A, yeah. lot, a lot of big apartment buildings, but that's, that's true. No, that's a, <clears throat> that it's a good snippet, right? It, yeah. You know, Everglades, ocean, 10 million people like, and it, it's kind of wild to think how many people are down here. And then like, yeah. you, you know, you take off at Fort Lauderdale airport or wherever. And like, you know, a minute after takeoff, you, you see ocean and, Sure. Yeah, and like, yeah. There's not, it's not much land in between. Yeah, and and I know this is just a, you know, it's it's just a feeling, but I mean, in our pipeline, there's a lot of people still from out of the area that are actively looking and wanting mm. to buy here, even with the current economic data situation. Right. Everybody's still like, well, I want to have my Florida house, or I want to relocate, or still know. cheaper than a lot it of northeast locations, a lot of west coast yep. stuff. Um, <clears throat> Definitely. So still. Still cheaper and yeah, there's a lot more workplace flexibility. You're not, most, yeah. a lot of people aren't geographically constrained anymore. So sure. 
sure. Um, what what do you do in this low inventory environment? Like, how do you, you know, you get buyers that come to you, they want X, Y, and Z, and you know it exists, right? You just don't see it on the market. How do you how sure. do you go sniff that out for them or, or, or drum <laughs> we, it up? <laughs> we we do a lot of different things. So, um, you know, in in our in some of our systems, we have areas where we can you know, drop emails, get phone numbers, try to make phone calls, even knock on their door if it's acceptable. We don't like to knock on people's door because right now it, people look at that as kind of an invasion of privacy sometimes and they they have- they afraid yeah. of COVID or something? You no, know, I don't know. But maybe it changes it's just, a little it, it doesn't, yeah. yeah, I mean, it. sometimes it doesn't go over well, sometimes it does. And we, I mean, we, we do our best with it. And some I people, didn't love door knocking <laughs> either, but what I, what I did um, when I had like, you know, buyers like I want one of these hundred homes. Or, yeah. You know, if it's a thousand, I'm not doing this technique, but or maybe I'll pay a bunch of people to. But <laughs> if it was like fifty homes or less, right? I I do these like handwritten notes, and Same. I you know one of them one of them's handwritten, and then I photocopy. Yeah. I put it in a blank envelope. I don't put any label on it. No return right. address. Nothing. I slide it under the door. Oh really? Yeah. So you or, don't mail it. You no. don't mail it. So you're, you're, you're sliding it under the door. Cool. Yeah. Okay. You put, cause as soon as you put the mail on it, right now there's a return address label. Yeah. You know, they, they see it's from someone they don't know sure. or, yeah. or, the, or you're, you know, maybe cause of compliance, you have to have the broker. Was that, an, a, was there. that, a, was that a home or a condo building? This was townhomes. Townhomes. Okay. Yeah. Got it. I, I did it in condos though yeah. too. Yeah. I would just. You know, that would work. sneak past the concierge or mm -hmm. whoever if they had a door person and get it, get in somehow, right? The cleaning right. cleaning companies and the Chinese food yeah. food companies always do this. Yeah, because um, we'd always get those flyers. But yeah, so then they, you know, you get a blank envelope in your door. Uh, I'm pretty sure the open rate, unless you're not there or or you know, you know, oh, it's, it's gonna it's 100 percent, yeah, right? Because no they, they think it's a no neighbor, doubt. right? Yeah. They think it's someone mm -hmm. they know or. Um, so yeah, the first time I ever did that was a guy looking for townhouses and he, you know, he wanted the specific one. I'm like, and we kept, we, I kept finding him ones. He's like, no, I don't like this aspect or it has to be an end unit, but on this side, right? So we went from like a hundred that would work to 50 to like 11. And I'm like, well, if it's, if it's 11, I'm just gonna go put envelopes under their door. Right. And there'd only been one sale in this particular <laughs> townhouse community in the last year. So it was like no inventory. Mm -hmm. um, and I did 11 and I got four responses, four out of 11. So he, that's a strong response. I think. Yeah. Uh, he, he bought one of them. I got the listing on another and then a year and a half later, I got a, um, I put a buyer into one of the other four that, that helped me connect a nice. land development deal. Cause that, that buyer had to buy something to sell me his land. So it, it ended up in a, like a lot of money. It was, it was probably like a four hundred thousand uh, dollar effort there. You know, when yeah. you connected all those different parts. So I, I and then I've always stuck to that, like that that, that handwritten, slide it under there on, under the door, stick it or stick it in the door jam. Yeah, and, and right. no nothing on the envelope. <laughs> that's that's good. I'll, I'll have to try that. I mean, we've done stuff similar. We we hung stuff on their doorknob yeah. and handwritten notes that way, but we haven't done anything that's like blank, no, no label at all or no writing what's what's the approach when you get um, you know you put this marketing out there this person who's not on the market yet you know raises their hand and but it's like kind of like you're kind of coming to them telling them I've got a, a buyer right which now like people probably get flooded with that stuff right um, so yeah. how do you how do you kind of stand out and then you know, are you trying to like sell it to your buyer first or are you trying to get the listing first or is it like this is option A and then listing is option B? Or? Yeah. Well, if I'm working for my buyer in that moment, then I'm definitely trying to get it for the buyer first. Okay. And then if that for whatever reason doesn't work out, then we'll go for the listing as plan B. Um, if it's more of just a blanket canvassing marketing ploy, then we're going for the listing first, of course. Okay. That's what we're going to go for. Uh, what about... Um, the struggles right now with for particularly first home home first time <laughs> home buyers, right? They they've yeah. seen interest rates jump. Yep. But they've also seen their rents jump a lot. Um what's the market like down here in South Florida right now for first time buyers? Are are they there? Are they there but just frustrated or are they like screwed I'm gonna rent for another year or, or stay um, with my parents? It's <laughs> a it's a combination of all of the above yeah. again. It's like 
you know, there's, there's a lot of frustration. I've seen some of them that said, hey, maybe I wanted to do a single family home, I'll go to a townhouse. Or instead of the townhouse, it might be a one bedroom or two bedroom condo just to get started and kind of start that way. So we've seen a lot of that on the first time home buyer or you're just shifting neighborhoods, right? If you were looking at for, you know, half a million, a million bucks in one neighborhood, now that's just going to be a shift down to a different one. Right. Um, and yeah, there's, there's some frustration out there, but I think we've got enough, you know, market data now to get them to understand this is where the market's at. And if we want to be in it, this is what we got to do. Are they doing, are you seeing more creative things done? Like, like house hacking, <clears throat> right? Where they, uh, um, yeah, you know, there, they, they, there they are get, some get, of them. They get roommates. Uh, really? And... Uh, those are, that's for the single first time home buyers. Yeah. But, but I don't see as there are some of them. Um, but there's, you know, more that I'm seeing that are actually married first time home buyers. Okay. Where they didn't get married yet, they didn't own a property, and now they're trying to find, there's more frustration there. I think the house hacking is really big, and we see that, you know, kind of in, and, and, and it's nice because you can get around the associations too, right? I mean, I didn't say this, you know, on record, <laughs> but but you're, you're able to put somebody in and not have leases in place, and you've got friends staying with you and whatever, and so you're so able the, to So the associations deal. try to yeah. prevent... There, there, yeah, is a lot it, of, there a lot of associations, non, non-related people, or something? associations yeah. will technically prevent renting or leases huh. in a lot of them, okay. condo associations. So if you're able to get a condo and then have a roommate, gotcha. then it's, yeah. Yeah, Car- Carrie used to do that before we were um, dating and married. Like she had a townhouse and would have like, it had five bedrooms in it. It's a great, and it's a great move. The four, and then they... They tried to ding her once too, because like they, I guess in Arlington County, uh, they've got a lot of rules, but you can only have four non-related people living oh. in one. And uh, they, they, a lot of things up there. Maybe this is true in some other jurisdictions. They don't enforce. Uh, yeah. Right. So I think they they did it for a while. No one said anything. Then like, our roommate left, and someone put an ad on. They put an ad on Craigslist, like looking, you know, four roommates looking for another, mm-hmm. right? And then like. Some neighbor like reported him. Reported him. But, I mean, four um, seems like a lot already. So yeah, I like it. She was pushing the envelope, yeah. getting that fifth one in there. Yeah. So, but then they they came out and did nothing after that. Like they inspector came, yeah. but then did nothing. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that happens. They probably have bigger fish to fry. Anyway. What what about the Airbnb dynamic? Like that's another thing <clears throat> down here, right? Yeah, in Florida that has maybe driven prices up, constrained inventory, and just shifted the dynamic a little bit. It has, it's, it's really shifted the dynamic. We've got um, a lot that are using for second home, really. Like they wanna come down and use it for vacation, maybe a month or two out of the year and rent it out. We've had several of those. And it's really hurt our single family rental market. Because it? yeah, there's, yeah, it's there's taken not off as many of the, the annual lease uh, options for, right. the, for the people out there looking. Um, there's still a few, but they're just getting gobbled up for mm. you know short-term rentals. And I mean, you'd probably know this better than I do because you, you keep close tabs on it. I'm not sure what that inventory is starting to look like on the uh, short-term market down here. I know certain municipalities are better than others. You've got you know Lauderdale by the Sea, Fort Lauderdale, Oakland Park, Pompano, and some are more friendly, but um, and, and I'm not sure if any of these are going to crack down more than they have already. Yeah, well, they've yeah we've done it in Deerfield, Lauderdale at, at the Coral Ridge place, and then Lauderdale by the sea. Right. Um, they all have licensing, which we've gone through uh, and have to like redo annually. They sure. they all have different like little quirks and, and rules. So yeah, you have to do your homework first mm-hmm. on all of that. But like that's that's a whole nother area where a real estate agent can go out and get good at and definitely learn. And guess what? Now you potentially have a client that'll do like one a year, or two a year, right? Like so. Yeah. Um, and especially the, the luxury uh, short-term rental market is, is pretty big down here too. You get in the properties that are on the water, three, four, five million bucks. People are loving to purchase those, pick them up and, you know, turn those for a few grand a night. Yeah, I remember, I guess this is further down south, but beginning of COVID, those were... Those were pretty big, like when the bars were still shut down, they became oh, like yeah. party, oh, yeah. <laughs> party rentals and stuff, and there's a lot of buzz around that. What what specific like luxury uh, markets are you in? Like when you say luxury, because a lot of places sure. down here would be luxury to yeah. people from different parts of the U.S. So when you say that, what does that mean to you? Which areas are you really trying to do your listing? Sure, in? to us, it's typically the coastal markets, which is pushing uh, East Fort Lauderdale, Lighthouse Point, East Pompano. 
uh, now, um, you know, going all the way up to East Boca. Um, and we've done some stuff up in Delray too, and even getting okay. into that downtown West Palm market, uh, which has really exploded over the last couple of years too. So kind of up just right up the coast from Broward to Palm Beach is where we typically go. Where do you think the market goes from here <clears throat> looking out the next six to 12 months? Man, don't quote me on any of this. Yeah. No, uh, I, I think I think we'll definitely see some continued softening, a little bit of slowing. I don't know what the inventory is going to look like because I don't see a huge incentive for people to sell and move if you're an end user right now. I don't know right. why you would just jump to a higher interest rate unless you really wanted to move up somewhere. Um, so I think inventory is still going to stay somewhat low. And I don't think people are going to get in a spot where they're a forced seller. I don't right. see the forced selling model happening unless something catastrophic happens. Yeah, um, the move up buyers <laughs> are, are all on pause now, right? Yeah. Like you said, yeah. why buy a bigger place at a higher rate than your cheaper place at a much lower rate? So that's... That's, a, that's an inventory and constraining I'm seeing, environment. I'm seeing a lot of those sometimes maybe even decide, hey, instead of moving up, maybe I go buy an investment property. Yeah. Um, which is kind of, I'm seeing that move happen. So then um, that constrains it even more. Yeah, it constrains it more. They're just gobbling up more inventory. Um, but I think we'll see a continued softening. I think, you know, pricing will maybe take a step back a couple percent, you know, maybe five, maybe three. I don't know. There's different forecasts that I look at that are maybe we stay pretty flat and plateau or we kind of step back three to four over the next couple of years. Yeah. On the forced selling, like, you know, oh, in the early 2000s, you probably saw this. The yeah. difference between getting a loan now compared to then is night and day. We yep. had Dodd-Frank, which was probably overreach, but bottom line is there's no more of these no income, no job, no asset ninja loans. And Correct. Know, people that are that are buying are putting down payments. You know, they got skin in the game. They've got good credit, 750 versus like 690 mm -hmm. average, you know, the difference in credit on a borrower today versus then. And then I think the other big difference is um, they, they can afford the payments, right? Or at least right. going into it, they can. Yeah. Um, you know, if they lose their job, that's different. But so, so people can afford it and there's not a lot of people that have negative equity. So I. Oh, there's a lot of nested equity. I mean, people yeah. that bought a year ago, you've got another, you know, 30%. Now, of course, even if that goes away, you still maybe have 20, 10%. You still got the equity there. Yeah, the average debt on the American house is only at a 40% LTV right now yeah. on houses with loans. So, I think it's the lowest ever historically, um, right? It's or since, like, since the early 80s. Probably, probably since like, yeah. Yeah, when the interest rates were like yeah. insanely high. So I think right. that's different. And then I think you, um, you don't have. Uh, this this uh, situation where you know people are going to be forced to sell, and then the next person's forced to sell even lower, right. and like walking away. Like if if you've got a good credit score, like you're probably not going to walk away from your house over correct ten percent negative equity, mm -hmm. right? Um, Five percent negative equity, right. but you know if you back then it was like thirty percent under, like okay, I'll walk away and I won't I won't buy anything for seven sure. years, you know? Right, right. Um, so I, th I think that's going to constrain it. So we'll see where it goes. Yeah, we will. We will. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think I think we bottom out in Q1. I think right now the toughest group that this hits is real estate agents because it's just sure. it's just limited transaction. Yeah. We haven't seen yeah. too much price movement, and uh, <clears throat> sellers need to realize you know ten percent isn't the end of the world, yeah. right? So yeah. eventually they'll throw in the towel. I think we'll see a ten percent ish drop in a lot of markets Florida yeah. I think we'll do a little bit better than most but yeah I think that's Q1 and um, then we'll start to see transaction volume come up a little you know if we do get into this recession interest rates will probably come back down a little bit not, they're not gonna go down to two again probably right. but um, yeah I don't I mean it's crazy maybe yeah I've got two uh, two houses that have loans in the twos so it's nuts I mean um, and where do you think rates are gonna get going to the end of this year and into early next year. I I think we'll by the yeah, sometime in Q1 we'll be like in the low fives, I think. Really? High fours. Yeah. You think it'll get back down that far? You, you you think they'll jump it up to 6 and a little slightly yeah. north and then and then bump back down once they see a reaction or what? Yeah, I think I think I think when things slow down, that's hmm. that's probably that's what's happened historically, yeah. right? Right, most, right. Most of the time. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, I think there could be an opportunity for expired listings for agents because yep. you know people that are 
selling based on spring prices, eventually you're gonna expire. So sure. I, think, I think getting good at making those calls, which is not that hard to do, it just takes repetition. Yeah. So I think that that's a skill I would invest in or activity as an as a agent, new agent in particular. Definitely, and I, I would I would go, I, there's some good callers on YouTube, people that use tips. I, I don't, I'm not good at it, I'm terrible yeah. at it, but I'll go watch some of them before I go do some intros or calls because they've got some really nice, you know, ways of diffusing somebody up front and just getting into the conversation. And I think that's a very important skill in real estate. All right, well, are you tired? Are you ready for the hyper fast round? Okay, well, I don't even know what that is, but let's do it. All right, it's a couple questions we'd like to okay. do at the end here. What's your biggest piece of advice to a new agent? Get on a team. What's a mistake that you see experienced agents making? Um, not working. Mm. What is the biggest challenge you've had in the business and what do you learn from it? Um, making cold calls. All right. Something you're doing now in the business that you weren't doing a year ago. Leaning more on my team. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Uh, still running a team, purchasing investment properties, and working in real estate because I love it. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show. Uh, before we sign off, if people want to get in touch with you, connect with you, learn about buying, selling a home, or join sure. your team, or any of that good stuff. What you do guys do? can follow me at Jimmy Branham on Twitter, uh, at Branham Group on Instagram. I'm also, my personal is at Jimmy Branham on Instagram, but all my activity in real estate stuff is at Branham Group on Instagram. You all can right. look us up on Google, too, if you want. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having and, me. Uh, to all of our listeners and viewers out there, thank you for tuning in. Please do us a favor. Share this with other people that you think would benefit, and we'll see you next time.